Okay. All right, I'm letting people in. Look at all those people. <laughs> oh, my friend Don, my friend Pam. Oh my God, I see a lot of people I know. This is so fun. <laughs> oh, I see Alana's here. That's so fun. So if anybody wants to turn their camera on and say, hi, I'd love to see you. And then yeah, you can keep your camera on, but we'll start a PowerPoint and then you might want to turn them off. But I love having a discussion. I love seeing people. So would love to see you. Uh -huh. Oh, there's Sandy. Hi, Sandra. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Hi, Alana. Hi. Oh, this is Happy so cool. <laughs> Great to see you. <clears throat> and great to people see here. I don't know. Yeah, they said they had. Oh, hi, Dawn. Oh my God, Dawn, it's been too long. So fun. All right, we still have people joining as we as we speak. Okay, we have thirty-eight participants. We can definitely give it a few minutes here for people to come in. I'm so excited to see everybody. <clears throat> And feel free to unmute yourself and say hi. I really love to make these things a discussion. So, um, hi. Hi, hi, Susan. Great name. Hi. I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome. Thank you. Great, great to see you. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm just trying to uh, say hi to everybody there, Kira and Lisa. So, Courtney, you just let me know when you think we want to start, okay? I still see people coming in, so I think oh, we give it a few more minutes if everybody so doesn't mind waiting. <laughs> Mark and Don, I see you both. Can they see me? <laughs> I do see you. Hi, how are you? Hi there. It's been too long. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm walking with my dogs. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> so I, I don't want to make everybody dizzy. So I'll take, I'll take my photo off. Okay. okay. We just came in from a dog walk. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So I can Beautiful. figure it out. Oops. Beautiful. All right. So what time? We got a couple of messages already in the chat. <clears throat> Smithfield, Virginia. Mary Kate doesn't want to show her face. That's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> Let's see. It's 105. So Courtney, yeah. you just let me know. Why don't we go ahead and get started? I'll just keep adding people as they show up and you can just okay. keep rolling. Okay. Did you want to do an intro or should I just dock? Oh, um, everybody. I know you guys saw the, the welcome email. Where's your um, stick? What? Where's your stick? Oh, oh yeah you can put yourself on mute if, if you're mean, not talking yeah I'll, that'll I'll make it easier for if, us yeah. if needed <laughs> um this is susan uh susan weiss boland and she has written three books on ayurveda uh, specifically to reach people that may not be familiar with ayurvedic practices and today we are going to be talking about um, ayurvedic home remedies for the beginner and so we're very happy to have her here with Pure Indian Foods today. Oh, thank you, Courtney. And I'm so excited that Sandeep is here and a bunch of people I know. So that is really exciting. And even people I don't know, I'm happy to see you. Um, I just, I'm just excited to be on this platform because I feel like I started in Ayurveda. Um, I'm not sure what year Sandeep started, but I think I met Sandeep in 2008 or nine. What yeah, year did you begin? I, yeah, that's yeah. We started in two thousand eight. So two thousand eight, and I think we met at a, a national Ayurveda conference, maybe in New Jersey mm -hmm. or somewhere. And Sandeep was pulling cases of ghee out of his trunk of his car, <laughs> and I could not be prouder of where he has come. He and his family are just the purveyors. I'm not going to do a salesy thing, but you all know that he is purveyors of some of the finest. Indian products, spices, ghee, oils, um, mung beans, so many things on the website. The mango, oh my God, the mango <laughs> in my fridge right now. 
I just can't believe what he has done. And he's done it all with so much heart. And that's why I've just always loved everything he's done. And that's why in every single one of my books in the resource guide, I think they might do it alphabetically, but I put him first. <laughs> and then they did it alphabetically. <laughs> but I always have him first. So I'm really excited to be here with everybody today. Thank so you, thank Susan. you. Thank you. So I am gonna sit still in a minute. So what we're gonna to do today is I'm gonna do a little PowerPoint presentation that's not boring, I promise, where I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a background on Ayurveda because Ayurveda is this Indian science of health and healing. As you might or might not know, it's over 5,000 years old, but I want you to get a feel for it because how we work with medicine, spices and healing properties in Ayurveda is mainly through the food that we eat. We say food is medicine. So I'm going to talk about your mind body constitution and what is best suited for you. And we're, we will have lots of time for question and answer. And even during my presentation, I really don't want you to get lost and not understand anything. So please either raise your hand or put a question in the chat or just simply unmute yourself and say, hey, Susan, I have a question. I'm really, I really want you to understand everything that I'm talking about. <clears throat> okay, everybody agree to that? Sounds good. So I'm gonna start by sharing my screen here. Ooh. Oh my goodness, I don't see my PowerPoint. You guys give me one second. <laughs> Always something, right? I gotta find that PowerPoint. <clears throat> One second. You always think you got everything all done. <clears throat> it's okay, we can see your lovely view in the meantime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and let me get this slideshow from the beginning. Can you see the PowerPoint? No. Okay, so let me try um, sharing screen again here. Share screen and the powerpoint there we go all there. right you got it there okay great so let's do slideshow not that slideshow from beginning okay you guys good you see it yep yes <clears throat> all right fantastic so that just i do look like that oh look i'm wearing kind of the same color today yeah <laughs> it's a pretty recent picture so I am that person, Susan Weiss Bolin. I came across Ayurveda in 2007. I went to the uh, Chopra Center in California to do something called Panchakarma, which is um, an Ayurvedic detox program where they do all this stuff to you to get toxins out of your body. And um, it was a 10 day program. And they also taught us about Ayurveda. And I just fell completely in love with this ancient science. I was 40 something years old. I'm 60 now. So you do the math. I was 40 something years old and I was about 50 pounds overweight. And I had been for a long time going back and forth with my weight. So um, I, I sort of just felt stuck where I was and I wanted something different in my life that wasn't about dieting. That was really about loving food and learning about the nurturing properties of food and how it could serve me. And oh boy, did Ayurveda answer that question. <laughs> so I sort of dove in completely and got um, my first certification in Ayurveda from the Chopra Center in California. And then I went on to study with many, many really huge, wonderful, extraordinary teachers of Ayurveda across the India and the US, including Vasant Ladd and others, Amadea Morningstar, whose cookbooks you all might have. She's amazing. And then, you know, I just, I became this practitioner and I've been practicing since 2008. And um, I had a bookstore at the time. And after 10 years, I closed the bookstore to just practice Ayurveda full-time. And I'm writing full-time as well about Ayurveda. So that's sort of how I came to this, in case you're curious. It just it's not just about weight loss. You know, I did lose the weight, but that just made me like super healthy, exuberant, excited, and ex enthusiastic to share everything that I've learned with the world. And obviously, I'm not Indian. I'm just a Jewish girl from Baltimore. But Ayurveda just really spoke to me, this Indian science 
spoke to me, this ancient, you know, ancient wisdom. I guess, you know, I come from, you know, a lineage of ancient, ancient wisdom as well. So I felt really drawn to this, um, to what was happening in India 5,000 years ago as well. And, and I obviously just embrace and love the practice. So here, you know, a little bit about Ayurveda. And let's see. Oh no, it's not moving now. Okay, so Ayurveda is made up of um, the building blocks of nature. It's made up of the same elements that are outside of us in nature, as well as inside of us. So here we have the Sanskrit and the English names for these um, <clears throat> elements. We call them the Panchamahabhutas, space, which is Akasha in Sanskrit, Ayu, uh, uh, Vayu is air, Tejas is fire, Jala is water, and Pritavi is earth. So we are all comprised of these elements, just like nature is outside of us, we are also comprised of these elements. And those elements come together in a mind-body constitution called the doshas. And so they're called vata, pitta, and kapha, and I'm going to tell you the attributes for each of these doshas. Vata is air and space, pitta is comprised of fire and water, and Kapha is made of earth and water. So as I go through the attributes of each of these doshas, I want you to see that you might align a lot with one or another, but we are all made up of all three doshas. They give us movement, transformation, protection. We just, one or two usually predominates in us. And that's how we learn about what to eat, our lifestyle, our apothecary needs, which I cover you know, in this book. Um, to tell you how to help yourself with common ailments. So here we have vata dosha. Vata is made up, as I said, of air and space. And these are the qualities you can read. I won't read the whole slide. It's, it's quick, it's cold. It's just like the, the air and space that you can think of in wind. So vata is like the wind. I like to think of like Uma Thurman as a, as a vata person, tall, thin, light frame, uh, dry vata because of the air and wind going through their system. They usually have dry skin and hair. They usually run a little cold. They move and talk very quickly. I'm very vata today. I'm moving all over the place. They don't like to have a routine because they're very spontaneous and they love new experiences. So when a vata is balanced, they're super creative, very adaptable, great communicator. Um, they show a lot of initiative. They want to start this project, start that project and so on. But when they're out of balance, they might they have too much of this overactivity and not be able to complete things. They can they like a, you know, they get distracted by every shiny new object. They want to try this, want to try that, might leave a bit of a mess behind them, or just the excitement of trying new things. But when they're out of balance, when they have too much vata in their system, they can have an overactive mind, anxiety, worry, insomnia. They really suffer from constipation because of that dryness. Remember, they're like the wind. So when there's too much dryness in the body, they don't have enough moisture to have good bowel movements. And that's extremely important because bowel movements is one of the ways that we get rid of toxins in the body. We get rid of that through sweat and um, saliva, as well as urination and um, defecation. So we really need to make sure these things are working well. And I'll tell you how to make it work well um, after we go through all the doshas. <clears throat> Here we have pitta dosha. So pitta is really hot. It governs metabolism. It's hot, it's light, it's penetrating. It's a little bit moist because it needs a little bit of water to keep the fire from burning it up. So most pittas, um, they have a medium build, good digestion. They're very smart, very precise. They just, they love a routine, very courageous. I always say, if you're in a burning building, follow the pitta out of the building. The vata is going to be all distracted. And the kapha, as you see, might be hiding under their desk, eating their last box of cookies. So you want to follow the pitta person out of the building. But pitta, so pitta, when they're balanced, they're just this great leader, a really good decision maker, and they're very warm and friendly. But when they're out of balance, I think of, let's see, um, it's a Jack Nicholson in one of his scary movies. He can be really angry. Um, I'm thinking of that. Well, whatever, you can pick a movie. <laughs> um, when a pitta is out of balance because of all this excess heat in the body, they might have skin rashes, inflammation, migraine headaches, problems with their sight, indigestion, acid reflux. 
from so much heat in the body. So that is a, a pitta, pitta characteristics there. Now we have kapha. Kapha is cold and heavy. It's made of earth and water. So like what kapha is um, very steady, slow moving, but incredible stamina. So let's say, you know, that old, that old um, fable of the rabbit and the tortoise doing a race. So the rabbit is the vata and the tortoise is the kapha. So the vata rabbit is just hopping, hopping, hopping all over the place, excited to see everybody, but sure he's going to win because he's so much faster than the slow moving tortoise. But the tortoise is like, he's slow and steady. Boom, de boom, de boom. And he's making his way to the finish line. And if you remember, we all know that the tortoise wins the race. So that's a good way to think of kapha dosha. So the little bit heavy set, but they have excess oil in their body, a lot of moisture. So their skin is normally um, really smooth, thick hair. They sleep very deep and soundly. Um, as I mentioned, they have great stamina and they love a routine. They're balanced, steady, loyal, content. You, they're everybody's friend. Everybody wants to be friend with the kapha. But when they're imbalanced, they really, they get stagnant. They get attached, congested, overweight, overly protective. They like to nest and hold everybody around them. Um, so like Vata might suffer from having too much air and wind in their body, which can cause constipation, also arthritis, um, the dry skin, dry joint. Pitta has too much, can have too much fire in their body. They can have um, diarrhea, multiple bowel movements during the day, a lot of digestive problems from too much heat and acid. And I mentioned headaches and kapha because they can uh, because they can be so slow moving. They get the, this um, excess moisture in the body. They might have problems with bronchitis, sinusitis, seasonal allergies, and obesity. So here we're going to talk about medicine. And medicine in Ayurveda is food. There's food is medicine. And I'm going to add to that lifestyle and apothecary. Apothecary are things like the medicinal oils, the herbs that we take, and um, different ways that you can um, add different supplements into your lifestyle to help you out. So in my book, these are all pictures from my book, we talk a lot about self-care. So caring for yourself, like I always say you, as you be here on an airplane, we're all flying again, is to put your oxygen mask on first and then help others. So particularly Cappadocia, the one who's more caring and made of earth and water, tends to put everybody else's oxygen mask on before theirs. And by that time, they're just done. They are totally like passed out on the sofa or on the aisle of the airplane because they didn't put their oxygen mask on. So we need to learn to take care of ourselves first at every age so that we can take care of others more efficiently. Before I go on though, I wanna see if anybody has any questions about, um, about anything that I've talked about so far because I don't want you to be confused about anything. You can just unmute and ask me if you have a question. <clears throat> You're all very quiet and that's okay. All right. I'm still here if you want me. So one of the ways that we take I have care a quick of our question. Oh, please. Yes, Terry. Sorry. Um, so can you be a combination of these elements? Thank you Are so we... much for asking. Absolutely. Yep. You can totally be a combination of the elements. So you can have, let's say that you are a primarily Vata person. You were born um, and grew up as a kid. You're very skinny, very active all over the place, painting pictures, you know, drawing on the walls and you know, you know all sorts of stuff like that. But then as you got older, maybe um, this, this Vata person gained weight and they got very heavy and their body wasn't made to carry all that weight because they're primarily Vata and they have a, a lighter frame. And so they could suffer from gaining that weight they could suffer from arthritis and joint problems that maybe a kapha person wouldn't because they have a stronger frame. And so we would have to work with that person to, um, very carefully to do a kapha reducing diet and a plan like that, but not to aggravate the vata. So you can become, you can have an imbalance of another dosha sometime in your life but you have a primary dosha or to be bi-doshic that you're born with, 
<clears throat> and so we always sort of want to lean back towards that. Terry, we also have stages of life. So we're born kind of Kafic. Everybody hopefully is a little roly poly baby. And then you go through puberty, which is guess which dosho puberty is? Pitta, fire, acne, you know, the hormones raging, that's all pitta. And then as we go into older age, skin gets a little thinner, we dry up a bit, things change, and that's our vata stage of life. We also emotionally can become more creative and um, not really caring what anybody thinks about us anymore. And so that's more of your vata stage of life. So yeah, we go through these stages. And you can see it in yourself. And when you have a particular disease or illness, <clears throat> it's usually Vata moving through the body, but um, we can get into specifics of that. If anybody wants to have a consultation, I go into deeper information about that. But, um, but the answer is yes and no, basically. <laughs> Does that make sense? <clears throat> uh, it, certainly, it certainly does. <laughs> okay, great. All right. We have Courtney. a couple mm -hmm. messages in the chat. Great. Um, are you able to see the chat or should I try to read them? Uh, you can read it to me. <clears throat> okay. So Avani says, isn't that the difference between Prakriti and Vikriti? Vikriti. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, so pra mm -hmm. and you are born with a Prakriti, not a dosha. Is that right? So your Prakriti is your natural born Ayurveda constitution. Your Vikruti is where you're out of balance. So someone could go out of balance immediately when they're born. Something could happen. They could be born into a household where there's a lot of chaos and disruption, or it's very cold, or it's very hot. And then their Prakruti could change right away. And their state of imbalance is what we would treat. I'm just giving an example of, a, of an infant, but it can, you know, obviously it goes through life. So yeah, so your Prakruti though is your natural born Ayurvedic constitution, which we would say is your dosha. <clears throat> was there another question, Courtney? <clears throat> mm, nothing, nothing. Okay, yet. all right, great. All right, so I just talk here a little bit about Abhyanga because this is one of the mainstays of Ayurveda. You might notice if you've been to India, the women and the men have beautiful skin. They're like luminous. They start massaging with the oils they start, mothers massage their infant babies with oils, and then they all keep up the practice of, not all of them, a lot of people keep up the practice of doing a daily um, oil massage with an oil made for your dosha or for particular aches or pains or things you might be going through. So we do this practice where we rub oil on before your shower, we rub oil in a certain way up and down on the long bones and around on our joints all over the entire body. If we can, we allow it to sink into our skin for about 20 minutes. It stimulates what I call the body's inner pharmacy. And it helps to replenish the microbiome on the skin. We have microbiomes everywhere, not just in our gut, in our teeth, on our skin. We're just like a walking microbe factory, but we have good microbes on us and oiling the body really helps to keep that microbiome from um, deteriorating and also preventing environmental toxins from coming in. So after we do this massage, we usually rinse it off and leave a thin sheen of oil in the skin. And I can tell you that's one of the I can tell you because I'm telling you, it's one of the greatest things that you can do for your skin. There's also dry brushing. So sometimes like here in Baltimore, where I live, it's extremely humid, like 90% humidity. My hair is like, anyway. So I often do dry brushing instead of oiling uh, in the summer, especially because I'm just too sticky to oil. But as much as I can, I, I use oil and I would suggest you to. You too. Now, one of the great pillars, you know, we have food, self care, but sleep is one of the most important things you can do to rejuvenate your body. Through sleep, we um, we help the body separate nutrients from toxins at this time of night when the metabolism runs high, which is usually 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. It's very important to be asleep during that time frame so that your body can do this miraculous process that it does. And, in the, and then it pre prepares um, waste for elimination in the morning. If we're not getting good sleep, if it's disrupted, if we're not getting enough deep sleep, if we're going to sleep too late, we really miss out on this, this um, really magical metabolic 
experience that the body goes through to clean itself out, mind and body. The mind also needs to have that rest period. So um, the book goes through, the book has a whole section on sleep. Um, and we go, I go through for each dosha, what you can do, what you, how you should eat during the day, how you shouldn't eat three hours before bedtime, or if you're extremely hungry, the different types of combination of foods and carbs or different spices like um, golden milk, you probably have heard of it. Yeah, I had the recipe here. This is something that most people can do well with, with golden milk. Of course, you must use the turmeric and the ghee and everything from pure Indian foods to guarantee that you're getting the highest quality. I would do that. You can do this with milk or goats or um, a non dairy milk. But this is something that naturally helps people to uh, just go into a deeper relaxation phase before bed. The pinch of nutmeg is extremely important because nutmeg is a sedative. And so that really helps. And so you find these recipes and many more in the book. Breathing. No, that's not me. Everybody thinks that's me. My hair is a little grayer. That is not. But breathing is another thing I talk about respiratory health a lot in the book because getting fresh air, as we know, I mean, here where I live in Baltimore, for the first time ever, we had these air quality alert days um, because of the wildfires from Canada. We were in a haze. I never saw anything like that um, in Baltimore. And I put out an, in, an Instagram video. If you um, want to find me, just my name, Susan Weiss Bolin, on Instagram. I have a great video that talks about all the different things you can do to breathe well. Um, respiratory health is so important because we, as we breathe in, we're taking in toxins, and we have to be able to properly get rid of the toxins on the out breath. And so we need to do things in our atmosphere and to our bodies to help us breathe safely and healthily. And so as healthily words, I don't know, with good health. So here I give, these are Shikari and Shitali breathing, um, which is also in the book. These are a great summertime breaths to cool down the body. Um, it would look like the Shitali is with a rolled tongue like this. And you inhale deeply through your tongue to your belly and then close your mouth and exhale through your nose. So I see some of you trying it. Let's do it again. And if you can't roll your tongue, you can do it the way it's written here through um, your gums, through your cheeks like this. And there, <laughs> you're a dog doing it too. And what you notice there is you're bringing cool air into the body, but you might even get a little dizzy because maybe you didn't take a deep breath all day long. I think I haven't. <laughs> um, taking a deep breath to your belly is really important for um, to get uh, the good nitric oxide and everything that we're breathing in into all of our cells. And we know it's very relaxing to do that. So this is a really nice cooling breath. And then I have instructions for alternate nostril breathing in the book, which is Dr. Vasant Ladd, who I've studied with so much over the years, calls this sort of the king of breath work. He says it can heal everything from menopause to autoimmune diseases, but it, it certainly helps me, especially it did help me through menopause and hot flashes. And um, it really helps if I have a headache. If I sit and I do alternate nostril breathing, which is just holding one nostril and then the other and breathing in very deeply. And exhaling. If I do that 10 times and I have a headache, it gets rid of my headache along with a little bit of peppermint oil on my fingertips and massage into my scalp and making sure to drink enough water. That's all in the book. So according to Ayurveda, the juncture of the seasons is the most crucial time to uh, change our diet, to do a cleanse, to boost immunity. So right now we're in the heart of summer, but in, in my books, especially in my books, the one that's a colorful one here, excuse me, seasonal self-care rituals. I really give you all these really important things to do as we go from one season to another. Summer to fall is one of the most important times because summer goes from this, you know, heavy, hot, some people it's humid, some people it's a dry atmosphere. 
to this like super dry atmosphere of fall in most places where the leaves get all crunchy and we lose a lot of humidity. So we really have to make sure that the body is well taken care of in order to detox from the summer foods going into the fall foods. So as we go into winter, we can eat those hearty foods and perhaps, you know, to just be able to nourish ourselves more deeply. And so that's, that is in the new book, but covered extensively in seasonal self-care rituals. Doesn't that food look amazing? I, you eat, everything you eat should be all these colors. It's so beautiful. <laughs> um, this is a, a hydration recipe, smoothie recipe I came up with for summertime. Ayurveda does not love smoothies though, because we don't like cold drinks. So I like to say that you can heat up your milk or heat up some water to add to it to make it warmer or room temperature um, really helps. So you might want to look into uh, try playing with this. The rose petal jam. I think a pure Indian food, they sell a rose jam, don't you? We do. We have a rose yeah. petal jam that our friend um, makes over in Italy. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that stuff is amazing. And then fresh basil and so on. These are all things that are cooling and hydrating. So did you, does someone have a question, Courtney? Yes. Um, speaking of warming up milk, Laura asks, is golden milk safe for toddlers? And along with that, any tips for feeding kids in accordance with their dosha and especially making sure that they are getting enough nutrients during their picky eating stage? Okay. So Dr. John Duyard, uh, wrote a book called Ayurveda and maybe kids. It might even be on my shelf. It's like a 20 year old book. Um, I'm going to, I don't see it. I'm going to put Dr. Duyard's name in the chat. It's hard to spell, but he has the best book. Um, his company is, oh, okay. So I've already started. D-O-U-I-L-L-A-R-D, John Duyard. Um, <laughs> He, he has the best book for um, children and Ayurveda. I, I want to say that I'm not a doctor and I, I would not make recommendations um, for the health of children. And I never tell people to go off medication and so on without a doctor telling them. But um, as far as golden milk for children, I actually am not sure if that amount of turmeric and nutmeg and cinnamon, I don't know. And I'd have to look that up or you could look that up. But I think making any kind of warm milk product is really good without the spices and maybe warm milk and ghee because the warm milk um, has tryptophan in it. It's activated by heating it and tryptophan helps you sleep naturally. So yeah, I just have to be very careful and also not knowing somebody's health history if they take medication and so on. So it's, it's very hard to make general recommendations like that. Um, in the book, there's a dosha quiz. Uh, all my books have dosha quizzes. So you can take the quiz and that can help you more figure out, help you better figure out um, what you can do. But also I suggest finding an Ayurvedic um, consultant in your area, or you can contact me and I'm happy to help you out. All right. So here, Oh, this I love. So this is in the back of my book. I have this, how to create your own Ayurvedic apothecary kit. It's how to make your own medicine kit. Things that you should always have at home. Things so you just, you know, you should always have these in the cabinet. And um, I won't go through them all, but you can see a lot of these things you can buy anywhere or some things like Mahanarayan oil or neem oil, Tali Sadi, Sita Pilati, which is great for coughs and colds. You might need to go to an Ayurvedic website like Banyan Botanicals um, or Kerala Ayurveda. It's all listed in my book. But um, as far as, you know, things like ashwagandha, ginger, all the, the um, all the spices and things you can get from pure Indian food or a lot of things you can even get, like you can get ashwagandha in your market, supermarket now, I see it everywhere. Um, so th this is just great. If you just make this at home, you'll just always have these things on hand if something goes wrong. I love like if I had like we had COVID um, October, 2020, and then we kept getting these respiratory infections. And I just had this great um, steam with essential oils for the respiratory infections that helps you heal faster 
and get through it. And that is um, boiling water, pouring it into a bowl and taking a few drops of lavender, a few drops of um, eucalyptus oil and a few drops of tea tree oil. And um, then you put a towel over your head and you breathe and you do that a couple times a day. Those essential oils have antibacterial, antifungal, you know, properties. This is not woo woo. This is real. <laughs> and so um, by doing that, you know, that's one of the simple remedies that's in the book, but by having those things on hand, you can um, more easily help yourself get better if you do get sick. Okay. And so something that came to me when I was writing this book and writing all my books is that about Ayurveda? So some of these things can be expensive. Ayurveda was created um, for medical care for Indian royalty back in the day. But I really want to help everybody. But not everybody can think about doing a daily massage or steam with essential oils when they're trying to get their kids off to school or get to a second job or, you know deciding on a lot of other things um, or not able to get fresh food, can't get berries or melons, they, you know, only have packaged food stores in their neighborhood. So it's just trying to think of ways that we can make this more accessible to people. And so I have an air, a section in my book about how we can all help create a healthy community. And I give you some ideas for how to do it. I know my husband and I brainstormed on it a little bit and came up with some ideas about finding out who needs help and then um, giving, helping them you know, through social media sites, get to social services and access to goods, teaching people how to grow their own vegetables. You can do it in your house in a vertical garden. You don't need to have a lot of space just to grow a few things so that you can have more fresh food. Uh, many urban communities and suburban communities have uh, gardens that people can participate in and you can even start your own in your community. Um, looking out to where there are food deserts and letting people who might live in a food desert know that there are places to order like Pure Indian Foods. I also love Vitacost to eat in foods, even Amazon. You can find things that you might not be able to get in your area. And so that's another way to help. Um, something important, instead of uh, buying wild caught fish, which is very important not to buy farmed fish, but it's super expensive. You can also look to buy canned mackerel, salmon, tuna, sardines. They all have incredible properties of omega threes and, and nines and very, very healthy for you. And most of the canned is um, wild caught. Um, uh, looking at um, organic produce, what you need to buy versus what you can get away with not buying organic. So um, EWG, which is the Environmental Working Group, has a neat list of the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. And you can see which, which foods you must buy organic and which foods you can get away not buying organic. And then local ethnic stores, like we have H Mart and we have incredible Indian stores. A lot of the things that I write about are available at those stores at very affordable prices. So that is just a little snapshot of my book and uh, I hope that you get it and that you enjoy it. And uh, I am here for you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Let's see, sharing the screen. And then we can have a chat if I can stop sharing somehow. Let's see. I am not sure how to stop share. It's not. Are you still, are you seeing me you, or you my... did? You, you, I stopped, did? Okay. you stopped sharing, at least on my screen. I now have the gallery. Okay, great. So I'm here with you. I am here with you for any questions or anything uh, you want to talk about. I am happy to also, you know, I, I don't mind getting personal if you have a personal question, but I just want to make sure there's time for everybody if you have something that you want to address. So, wow, there's like nearly 50 of you here. How amazing. So what's going on? Talk to me. So we have I one question. question. But, oh, never mind. Go ahead, Claudia, and then I'll read a question in the chat afterwards. Okay, I actually typed this into the chat and I was just wondering, because I wonder about this every day when I know I'm doing it wrong. Um, is it okay to oil up um, after a shower? Okay, so <laughs> I, I really love to oil after a shower. 
But I have this great friend who's an Ayurvedic practitioner named um, Jay Shree. She's in um, on the west coast of Canada. Jay Shree thinks it's terrible that I tell people <laughs> that they can do that. She <laughs> says the reason why you're and she's brilliant. She says the reason why you oil is to release toxins in the skin as well, and you must shower them off. Okay. Okay. But I'm. I think that any oiling is better than no oiling at all. And especially in winter, I love to oil when I get out of the shower. I might oil a little before and then a little more after. It feels so good. So do what you can. <laughs> okay. Sometimes I dry brush before and oil after. That I think that sounds beautiful. You're doing, that sounds like a beautiful routine. Thank you. And can I just say this? I love, love, love your new book. Um, <laughs> I'm a novice, and but my first day of cracking it and just looking through things, I hit on a, a, a little simple truth in there that's made all the difference in the world for me already. So thank you. Oh my God, Claudia. Thank you. I don't, and I don't know Claudia. So no. <laughs> I, I thank you so much for saying that. This book, I, I actually do think this is, a great book also because the um the publisher they just made such a beautiful book they designed it in this way that you can um oh oral care is so important but that there's great um uh, diagrams in it the, the photos are beautiful it's laid out so clearly there's your poop chart which is really important to know about <laughs> um i talk about poop all the time but it's um you know we have we have it listed like food lifestyle and apothecary by condition. So it, things that fall into respiratory problems or gastrointestinal problems, sleep issues, aging. I do a lot on menopause. So there's, um, you know, it's broken down into ways that you can really digest you in pain, reproductive system, skin. I didn't even talk about the skin. The skin stuff in this book is fantastic <laughs> to learn how to deal with your skin, which is basically less is more. Stop doing so much to your skin. Um, that's all in the book too. <laughs> I have a question about dry brushing. Um, how much is too much? Can you dry, dry brush every, every day or every other day? Yeah, it depends on your skin condition. If you are Vata or Pitta, I um, wouldn't dry brush too much because Pitta can have very um, red irritated skin and Vata can have dry skin. It's a, it's a much better everyday practice for Kapha who has a little bit thicker skin, a little bit oilier skin. Um, and when you do dry brush, we say start at the bottom, uh, even the soles of your feet and work your way up towards your heart. And I would just do like six to eight strokes on each part of your body and not more than that. Does that help? Yeah, and then um, trying to get the lymph flowing is uh, one of my main reasons for doing it. So, um, yeah, also some marma therapy, um, okay. which I do also talk about in the book. Marma is like Ayurvedic acupressure. So, you can do marma therapy by holding certain parts. I'm going for like back here, there's like important lymph nodes and around your ears and so on. Just holding and pressing um, can allow the lymph to flow under your arms. There's many, many, many different marma points all over the body that can help you with that as well. Okay, and that's in the book? Yes. Do you have the points in the book? Okay. I have some points. There are 600 and some points. Okay. I have points for like um, for like headache and, I, and for insomnia and for some pain I have in the book. Um, so yeah, I saw, I just saw a question pop up about Garshana gloves. Garshana gloves are made of raw silk and that is a great way to, to do dry brushing is with Garshana. And you know what, if you're Pitta or Vata, Garshana is probably better for you than a dry brush. Good point, thank you. Okay, I, have thank question you. I have a question about oilings. How do I know what type of oil to use? So it depends on your dosha and it depends on the season. Okay, so once you do your dosha quiz and you find out, you can go like my favorite easiest website to use is Banyan Botanicals, um, banyanbotanicals.com and they have uh, dosha specific oils for vata, pitta and kapha. Also in my books, I tell you like al almond oil might be better for vata and mustard seed oil can be better for kapha. So you can also learn that way. But the ones that Banyan or like Kerala Ayurveda make and some other, many other companies, um, they, um, 
they infuse them with uh, herbs. So they're herbalized oils that are infused for each dosha. So that, that's a good way to go too. I just noticed my friend Gabby Hansen is on here. Gabby, hi. Oh my God, it's been a long time. <laughs> Gabby is uh, in Europe, so it's just delightful to see her. Oh my God, it's so fun to see you people. You can turn your cameras on. I'd love to see all your beautiful faces. <laughs> um, but the, does that help, um, Parsha? Yeah, yeah. Thank Parsha. you so much. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have a couple questions in the chat. If you, if you yeah. want, I can read them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Eleanor says, is there an Ayurvedic remedy that helps with brain fog? Yeah, there, there are a lot. Okay, so one of my favorite ones is called Brahmi. Uh, Brahmi, you can get Brahmi ghee. Um, Sandeep, you have Brahmi ghee, right? We do. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, we do. So Brahmi ghee is, um, any way you can get Brahmi in your body, Brahmi is, is for the brain. You can get Brahmi tablets. Uh, Brahmi oil is in different hair oils and head oils that you can get at Banyan Botanicals. So that is, Brahmi is the number one way I would say to do that. Oh, look at that, there's a link right there. But also um, ashwagandha is an Ayurvedic herb that helps to relax the nervous system. And it's an adaptogen. It actually helps you relax if you need that. It can give you more energy if you need. But I feel that ashwagandha as a de-stressor, I think stress causes brain fog in many of my clients. And so I find um, ashwagandha tablets or tincture to be a really good way also to help with brain fog. Another thing to do though, besides supplements is breath work. So definitely do, there are several types of breath work besides alternate nostril breathing. There's one called Brahmini, where you hold your ears and you hum, you hold your eyes like this. Mm, that incredibly opens up the brain. So I'm sure that you can find videos on that one. I love that. And um, any kind of deep breathing will help. And also using the essential oils I mentioned, um, like eucalyptus, peppermint, putting a few drops on your fingertips and just massaging and inhaling can change the whole system. And exercise, like you're not gonna get away with just taking Brahmi or ashwagandha, you've got to do stuff. <laughs> so you have to you know, eat well, basically two to three meals a day, no snacks in between. Um, the food should be for your dosha, the quantity should be about uh, two handfuls of food, which is a nice bowl of food, uh, which is two thirds of your stomach. And then taking like a 10 minute walk after every meal. Um, and then just also getting more vigorous exercise a couple times a week. That's how you get rid of brain fog. Oh, and also have like nice people around you, right? You wanna be surrounded by awesome people who support you and encourage you and you wanna do the same for them. Um, I will say I have a lot of crystals and stuff. I don't know if it works, but I love all my crystals. That can be helpful as well. So yeah, it's not just popping a supplement. It's the whole, oh, and sleeping. You have to sleep well <laughs> to get rid of brain fog too. Yeah. Claudia, did you say something? No, oh, okay. I didn't. So there's a lot you can do to get rid of brain fog, but it's really about living a good lifestyle. So uh, there's another, there's several other questions, but I wanted to kind of piggyback off of what you mentioned about ashwagandha, because there's a question about ashwagandha. Um, Avani asks, can you talk about the specific uses of ashwagandha? I was told that it needs to be prescribed, yet it seems like these days everyone is suggesting it without a consultation or a prescription. I would say definitely talk to a provider before you start taking ashwagandha. First of all, you need to make sure that it's right for what ails you. So I see ash people like people come to me that are making smoothies with like ashwagandha, trifla, brahmi. They're putting everything into a smoothie and drinking a cold frozen smoothie first thing in the morning with all this stuff. It's not going to do shit for you. Sorry, it won't do shit for you if you take it that way. Okay, that is just not. You don't want to be taking these things all together in a cold smoothie. That's like a waste of your money. Um, in Ayurveda, we say that supplements affect you whether you take them before food or after food. And so it depends on what you're trying to do. It depends on the time of day. It depends if you're taking ashwagandha to 
help you sleep? Are you taking it for more energy? So there's a whole bunch that goes into it before I can tell you when to take ashwagandha. I need to know what is going on with you. Banyan gives really good explanations on their website. So I would start there if you don't have a practitioner. So just start there and see you know, what you might think. But ashwagandha, as I said, it's, it's an adaptogenic herb. It's gonna help you where you need it, but there are, you know, a hundred other ones that might be better for you. And that's really hard for you to figure out on your own sometimes. <clears throat> okay, can you talk about the ash gourd also called the winter melon and where can I find it? So I saw that come through and I'm not sure if that is the same as bitter melon. Is that the same as Sandeep, do you know? Um, oh, I think he's busy. Okay. Yeah. So uh, all I can say is that where I live, we have the we have local Indian grocers, and we also have a chain called Patel Brothers. And Patel Brothers, I think, has a really great website, and it's all over the U.S. Patel Brothers, I have to tell you, it's like going into a store in India. It is so amazing. I love Patel Brothers. Um, so you might be able to ask them there, because I I don't know if it's the same as um, as bitter gourd, I'm not familiar with it. It's not, I just looked it up, it's different. Okay. It's called a wax gourd. I just don't know. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I actually was away for 30 seconds. So we are talking about ash gourd, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, ash gourd, we used to eat it in India and we make uh, a dessert with it, but it's now available in Indian grocery store. See, it's basically green from outside, white from inside. And the reason it's called ash is because there's a little bit of like a dusty ash on the outside of it. Hmm. So it's also known as white pumpkin. Oh. Or, or in Ayurveda, it's known as kushumanda. Excellent. I learned something new today. And what are the healing, what are the health properties of it? I think the health property is, it's considered very cooling mm -hmm. and nutritive. Um, and um, I think it's basically a Rasayana as well, along with like some other spices. So just like we have Chavan Prash, there is a Kushuman Rasayana. And actually I made it a couple of years ago. I, I was contacting a farmer to grow organic um, ash gourd for me so that we can make uh, organic uh, Kushumanda Rasayana. So I haven't been successful so yeah. far, uh, but you know that's something uh, we are very interested in um, offering. Fantastic. And something interesting that Sandeep said it was um, green and white, and those are cooling colors for pitta, like a cucumber, uh, like a zucchini. So you can see that also the color of these fruits and vegetables also go with balancing your dosha. It's fascinating. And a rasayana, like Chavan Prash, a rasayana is, um, is, a, is a combination of fruits or, um, yeah, usually fruits, maybe honey or ghee, and that's uh, healing for the, for the body. I'd like to say something. Yes. Yeah, I use ashwagandha as a transdermal cream because my practitioner told me it would heat up my liver too much. And I'm in my 80s. So that was very appropriate for me and my age. So I thought I'd just share that. Is your doctor Dr. Teitelbaum by any chance? Yes. Okay, I knew it. Because <laughs> yeah. that is exactly what Marianne would prescribe. <laughs> She's I find it very helpful. She's fantastic. So yes, for she every, is. yeah, so everybody, Susan is talking about a, um, a woman who's, who's an Ayurvedic practitioner in New Jersey, right outside of Philadelphia. Her name is Marianne Teitelbaum. She uses a lot of transdermals based on a particular um, Vaidya Mishra, who she studied with for many, many years. She's incredibly brilliant and intuitive and i highly recommend anytime it's a more serious issue that i can deal with i send them to dr Teitelbaum. Oh, that's cool. wonderful that's that you're connected to her susan that's great yeah i learned about her through divya um, divya altar yeah so divya altar is a we have a small little ayurvedic girl i was divya about to altar. say <laughs> yeah, Divya is also phenomenal. She has a restaurant. I hope it's still open in New York. My husband it and I is. are in there. 
Yeah. yeah. Oh, she's the best. And she has fantastic cookbooks. And um, as someone mentioned, Dr. Mishra, who Dr. Teitelbaum studied with, um, was, they said, basically a dermatologist, but it, much more than that, because he really knows all the organs. And he uses these transdermal creams through marmotherapy and so on, really knew um, how the medicine can get to where it needs to go in the body. Just brilliant. Yeah, Dr. Mishra's family uh, uh, was in Ayurveda for, I think he used to say for 2000 years, he had a documented history. And wow. Vaidya Mishra came to my home in New Jersey many, many years ago. So far. Wow. That's so wonderful. Yeah, he passed away suddenly a couple of years ago. It was really shocking. But Dr. Teitelbaum is one of his you know, acolytes and she carries on the tradition. We're so lucky to have her here. Is what there else anything, can I do for you people? <laughs> is there anything that helps with hair loss slash alopecia? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a specific oil called Bringarage oil, um, which you can get at Banyan and other places. So uh, Bringarage oil, not only does it, um, does it help the hair you have stay lustrous and um, black, in India, women who use Bringarage oil and also coconut oil, their hair stays really black. Obviously, I did not learn about it early enough, but um, it also can help with hair loss. So doing this, there's a thing called Indian head massage and actually Dr. John Duyar just posted a video about it, um, how you do marmotherapy and head massage, which can really help to um, increase circulation in the scalp. Help. But also there's a thing about hair loss is it often has to do with stress and anxiety. It also has to do with genetics. So there's a lot you have to put into it, but using um, head massage and oils on your scalp early could um, help to slow down what nature might have intended. Like Pitta Dosha tends to go gray early and lose their hair early because they have so much fire in their body. It kind of burns out the color and it burns out the roots. So it's also dosha specific. Is there anything to help the regrowth? Um, so um, also Banyan Botanicals has a combination of herbs called healthy hair that has neem and bringarage and several other things in it. So each of those um, compounds on their own or in combination may help, but I can't make any promises. So I have a question about combining food. Uh, so I recently came across some video that, but that, that was talking about some Ayurvedic thing. So in that, it was specific, like specifically said that certain foods not be combined. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so one of them was cucumber and uh, yogurt, the right yep. touch of thing. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> but but that's my daughter's favorite kind of cucumber. And this one, she loves to eat that one. So my question is, how yeah. how is it like affecting and what what can I do? To yeah. <laughs> make so sure? you know, for that prasha, you might try to use like a coconut based um a coconut based yogurt or an okay. almond milk based yogurt. You might try that. The reason why we talk a lot about food combining is because foods digest at different rates. So let's say like um, you eat a peach and then you eat chili. God forbid you have those two things together. But anyway, if you do, so <laughs> what happens is the peach digests first because it's so sweet and has a lot of sugar. So your metabolic acids and so on go, go through it very fast. And then the heavy hot chili will just sit in your stomach. Let's, let's change it to oatmeal because a lot of people mix fruit and oatmeal. So then the oatmeal will just sit in your stomach until your body has another 45 minutes or so to produce enough hydrochloric acid to... Um, um, metabolize the oatmeal is going to just sit there and in ayurveda they say some foods begin to rot or get toxic while they sit in the system i'm not sure you know on the science of that but that is the old way but it so you don't you want to eat food that's going to digest rapidly and on its own so eating fruit about 45 minutes before a meal 
can help you digest both better. But also Ayurveda talks about not mixing milk with a bunch of different things, which is very interesting to me as a Jewish girl because it's very um, kosher. A lot of the food combining things are, are quite kosher in nature, which had to do with health. Um, mm -hmm. So it didn't have to do with religion, it had to do with good health. And halal, if anybody here is Muslim, the laws of eating a halal diet and a kosher diet are very similar in some ways to an Ayurvedic diet. All these diets came up in hot places. Mm -hmm. And so where certain foods went bad quickly, like dairy, so times have changed, but it's still, you know, it makes, it, it does make sense. Okay. So definitely something to avoid or use some alternative like non daily things. Okay. But when but when you make raita, you're also putting in um some spices or herbs, let's say, mm -hmm. that make the food easier to digest. So okay. there's also that. There's that. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there's a question in the chat. Sandra says, "I am 71." six foot female, usually very thin all my life until the last four years when I've suffered much loss of loved ones and gained 60 pounds rapidly. I know a lot was grief and psychological, but what dosha should I go by now? Whoa. So that's really, um, I, uh, who, who is this? Sandra asked this question? Sandra Thompson. Sandra. So I would definitely make sure that you've seen a practitioner um, a medical practitioner, not just an Ayurvedic practitioner, but an MD, because gaining that much weight that fast could have many different reasons. I don't know, to have the hormones level check, make sure there's nothing on the internal organs that's going on. Um, but then I would follow a kapha reducing plan for a certain period of time and see how that goes. And if anybody wants, like I have like charts or you can find charts online for, for kapha, pitta and vata, what to eat and what to avoid. And it's all in my books too. Um, actually the whole chart's not in the new book, but it's in my first two books, the Ayurveda Beginner's Guide and Seasonal Self-Care Rituals has those. But, but Sandra, if you haven't already gone to a doctor and had like a functional medicine doctor perhaps and had a good checkup, I would definitely do that. Okay, Claudia, go ahead. Hi, um, question. Western medicine relates to, uh, you know, heat, heat in this inflammation is bad. Inflammation in Western medicine appears to be the new, um, that causes all the problems, you know? So like if you have arthritis and everything else, uh, you know, it's bad. Is the heat or fire of Pitta um, analogous to, you know, inflammation of Western medicine, or are there, you know, different, I'm a Pitta, but I'm also told, I've been told by a physical medicine doctor that I had to go Mediterranean because I have to be anti-inflammatory because of my, you know, arthritis and, you know, and all that oh, kind of well, stuff. I'm yeah, wondering about that. I'm yeah, a Pitta it Vata. Is, yeah, it is. You are definitely Pitta Vata. <laughs> <laughs> and it's delightful. It's a delight combination. <laughs> but um, I would definitely say following a pitta reducing diet is an inflammation reducing diet. Ah, yeah. Okay. So the Mediterranean diet with um, tomatoes and uh, cheese, <laughs> excuse me, is not exactly pitta reducing. Mm -hmm. So I think that you could look and, and even olives which have a lot of salt. Olive oil is great. But um, you know, I, I would look at, um, I would look at a pitta reducing plan and the Mediterranean diet and do a cross reference there. But so I do want to reduce my pitta. I do. Yeah, I do yeah. want, I want to focus in that. I've, well, I've come to Ayurveda season. recently. So I'm, I, I know just enough to be really dangerous and, so and wrong <laughs> all the time. So you're really funny. Um, <laughs> I, um, I would say um, you're doing great, but I would also say that working with it, where, where do you live? Cleveland, Ohio area. I would say working with a practitioner or me or somebody, you know, I do all Zoom now anyway, would help you to sort of focus in on the issue. Like eating seasonally, sometimes I think trumps everything. 
So we're moving your definitely should be doing pitta reducing now because it's summer. But then as we move into fall, we want to make sure that we're doing vata reducing because fall is vata season and your vata could go really out of whack this fall. So we want to make sure you're getting avocados and oils and so on in your diet and then making sure you have enough unctuous and heavier foods to go through the winter but not to not like tomato stew and things like that that are not yogurts not sour spicy foods which will exacerbate your pitta so it's a little bit of a game but once you set up your kitchen and you have all your herbs and spices and you understand you know your lifestyle and your dosha and the season you're in which is ohio is very similar to maryland um so i you know we just we have it all at the ready and we can shift from one season to another and um stay balanced well i'm excited because i just googled and i found out we have indian grocery stores here and you know not 10 miles away so oh i'm so excited uh, yeah, yeah. Anything, there's a big hospital or a university you're going to have a lot of Indian markets and Indian people around. Is that, it's just the truth, you know. It makes a lot of sense. Yes. It, yes. We have a lot of um, Indian uh, medical professionals. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. That are here. Yeah. And when you get an Indian doctor, it's really like when I get an Indian doctor and I tell them I do Ayurveda, almost all of them say, I know nothing about Ayurveda. <laughs> <laughs> I saw an Indian dentist the other week. Oh my God, his name is Prashad, Prasad um, Chalagula. He was amazing. All he wanted to do was talk about uh, the Vedas, which is where Ayurveda comes from, and meditation. He was so adorable. I love talking to him. He wants to find his Dharma. He's doing surgery and he's telling me that dentistry is not his Dharma. I was a little worried, but he was a great dentist. <laughs> and he was such a beautiful man. So just that was uh, a great. Uh, a lot of uh, wonderful uh, people who, who have moved here from India who add so much to our, mm -hmm. to our society. It's incredible. All right, what can I do now for y'all? Eleanor, Eleanor asks, which of your books is best to begin with? So Eleanor, that's like asking me, which child do I like better? Yeah. But the, I don't have any children. So. <laughs> They're all my type dogs, and I, I love all my dogs and my husband. But um, oh, there's um, Claudia. She's such a wonderful person. She's holding up Ayurveda Beginner's Guide, which is a great place to start. So I would get Ayurveda Beginner's Guide, um, which is back here, as she showed you. And then my second one here, I'll show you. Uh, so this is Ayurveda Beginner's Guide, which was the first book I wrote in 2018. It has sold something like 60, 70,000 copies. It's just an enormous bestseller. Um, it's not as pretty as my new one, but the cover is very pretty. Seasonal self-care rituals goes through, we have like three major seasons in Ayurveda. So it goes through the seasons. I give you um, food and lifestyle, but also what I love and what I've done in this book is given you a lot of meditation, um, chakra meditation, because the seasons align to the different energy centers in the body, the chakras. And I give you um, non-chakra regular meditations also to help you align with uh, the seasons and seasonal changes. So they're, they're different. They're all, they're all really different and they really add up together to give you a very nice, you know, it's really a Western point of view of Ayurveda because you can read a lot of books by, by Indian doctors and so on. And, and sometimes, you know, especially of course the classical texts, they don't go into the lifestyle that we have here, which I think is really important for people to, to to use sometimes when you're using a book like on Chinese medicine or something like that, it doesn't take into account how we live our lives in the West. And um, I really, I think this is why I've written so many books and gotten so many book contracts is because the publishers and the readers really appreciate my very honest Western voice. And I'm also integrative. I do not tell you that if you have an infection, you should just treat it with Ayurveda. I tell you, you might need antibiotics. You know, if you have an ax in your head, I'm not going to give you herbs. You're going to go get stitches. So I really try to, to, um, to be as integrative as possible to use the best of all the systems that we have. 
And that's a very honest voice that I put into my books. Also saying, I'm not a doctor, as I've said here many times, but this is what Ayurveda has done for me and for my clients. And I see such huge changes for the better in people and people also taking control of their own health. So, but also let's say somebody has cancer and they're going through chemotherapy. I have people come to me I can't cure cancer. I don't know anybody who can, but I can support you in your therapies of choice. I can support you while you're going through chemotherapy or taking medication or after you have surgery, before you have surgery to prepare the body nutritionally and so on and how to take care of, your, of yourself afterwards. So it's this holistic view of treating illness and also keeping you healthy um, for as long as possible. I want you to be healthy until the day you die so that when you die, you die really whole and cognizant and present. That's what it's all about, I think, at the end of the day. Well, you have a really good life too, but then you die well. So that's what I'm trying to help people with. <clears throat> Long answer for which book to buy. I think you might have to buy them all. <laughs> And my books are available everywhere. They're major publishers available everywhere books are sold. Go buy local as much as you can. <clears throat> All right, is there anything else I can help anybody with? I don't have anything else in the chat right now. So if anybody else wants to speak up, feel free to unmute yourself. And I will just write in the chat how you can get in touch with me. Uh, Susan at breatheayurveda.com. The website is um, easiest to get to, Susan Weiss, bolin.com. Um, happy to do Ayurveda consultations with you. I also, since I started writing books, I have been um, just sort of longing to write more creatively. So I started. Um, learning creative writing. And as I do with everything I'm interested in, I get certified in it. So I got certified in some methods of creative writing and now I'm teaching writing as well. And I really look at writing as healing. Oh my God, writing is such a healing method. And so I lead writing classes and writing retreats. And I do have a writing retreat coming up in Iceland. Um, the it got filled up very fast. I opened the second week and I have a couple of spots left in my second week. And that's on the website. If you want to come to Iceland with me, I'm partnering with an Ayurvedic practitioner in Iceland. She's amazing. We're going to be doing yoga, meditation, talking about Ayurveda, doing um, some writing uh, classes, um, sort of prompt writing, flash writing, and also, of course, touring in the Golden Circle area of, um, of Iceland, which is magnificent, watching the Northern Lights soaking in hot tubs, traipsing through craters, watching lava flows. If you're interested in that, please uh, be in touch with me as well, because I would love to have you come. Thank you, Susan, for your note. Another Susan. One thing I know about all Susans is we're over 55 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank what's you. the weather going to be like in what's the weather like in Iceland in, in yeah. when you're on your tours? So it's in the 30s and the 40s and 30s. it's not really snowing yet, but it can be rainy and windy. But that's exciting. <laughs> you know, the landscapes and the wildness of it and and soaking in, you know, a 105 degree hot tub while you're in this like beautiful atmosphere. It's very wild. It's very um it just ignites you. It boy, does it cool pitta, but it very much ignites the muse. And and I, I've been three times, and I find it to be spectacular. Think about it. Yes, it sounds like <laughs> women who run with the wolves. <laughs> right, definitely one of those. Great. Well, you guys have been so much fun to talk to, and I love seeing those of you who are on camera. And um, I'm here for you. This is my Dharma, Ayurveda. So be in touch and I hope I'll come back some other time when we have some things to talk about. Susan, thank you so much for joining us and uh, giving this presentation today. We really appreciate you. You're so welcome, anytime. I appreciate all of you and everything that you guys do and Sandeep, it's just amazing. I have to come to New Jersey and, and Pet the cows one of these days. <laughs> Absolutely. Please do come. <laughs> I will. Good to see you, Susan. 
Thank you so Thank much. You. you too. Yeah, bye -bye. All right. Namaste. Namaste. Bye, everybody.